we start. See if we have anybody else coming on. We will be starting in two minutes. Yes. We're very excited to have you here. So welcome, welcome. Welcome everybody. You can view us on our uh, New York Now digital market platform, as well as through our Zoom. And let's talk to Maria. <laughs> hey, Maria, how are you? <laughs> are you hearing us now, Maria? Has she got her mic on maybe? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe she will come on over here, it looks like. We'll be starting very shortly. You yes. are fetching today. <laughs> Thank okay. you. I had to be. I went. I went and put on a snuggly sweater. It's quite cool here in the United in um in New York uh, today. It kind of dropped over the last few days, so we're actually starting to get that true winter weather. Um, yes, are. Yeah. So it's. I. I thought I'd put on something cozy, um, which we're going to talk about. Just that need for feeling cozy. Um, something we all are craving now in the midst of all of this. Uh, but I hope everyone's had a great and safe Thanksgiving holiday as we as we barrel through Black Friday and Cyber Monday and Giving Tuesday and Small Business Saturday. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> how many ways can we work with you to take your money and give you fabulous products? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, before we start and I do the introduction, it looks like we have Ruth Shapiro. She's still trying to sign in over on our digital market site. So we will let Caesar, who's behind the scenes, help her out. Um, but I think what we'll do is uh, go ahead and start. Does that sound good, Patty? That's fine. It's three. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Amy Lowenberg. I'm the Relations and Partnership Development Manager at New York Now. And I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Translating Macro Trends, Connecting the Dots, with the one and only Patty Carpenter. But before I introduce Patty, let's go over a few housekeeping items to ensure that you can enjoy today's presentation. Today's session is being recorded and will be available for immediate access on demand following our presentation. And if you need any technical assistance at any time, please use the chat features and we'll assist you right away. Should you have questions for Patty during the presentation, you may also use the chat feature on your screen. However, please note that we will be saving your questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentation, if time allows. It is now my honor to introduce you to Patty Carpenter. She is the principal of Carpenter and Company Trendscope and an award-winning creative director in globally sourced home decor, personal accessories, fragrances and gifts with extensive experience in product design and development, merchandising and color and trend forecasting. She has been successful as a micro enterprise specialist with US presidential recognition for domestic and international expertise in artisan development, entrepreneurial training, and economic development. Patty has traveled and worked in 57 countries and has spoken and written on color and trend and design around the globe as an international forecasting expert. She is a trend consultant with Pantone and is the global trend ambassador for Maison and Objet in America and Paris. She is an active board member of Serve International and an advisory board member of the Black Artist Designers Guild badge. Wow, Patty, let's <laughs> begin. <laughs> Again, <Yeah>. thank, <laughs> yeah. you. thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Translating Macro Trends, Connecting the Dots. And now the enchanting Patty Carpenter. <laughs> Thank you so the much. The floor is yours. <laughs> it's great to be with you all again. And hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this, this Thursday afternoon. Um, this is going to be a, a presentation that is jam-packed. I'm, I'm setting the stage for you now because I'm going to talk fast. I want to have time. I expect that we will have questions. I want to have some lively discussion. Um, but this is really about big picture, big sky thinking. So we're going to set up some, some some big macro ideas for you. And then we're, 
going to at the end translate them down into how we see them coming through in color. But certainly we'll also talk about how their effects will be coming through in many other ways. So the first thing I want to talk about when connecting the dots is this whole idea that how we do it from the culture, what's happening around us into product. And people always ask me how I do that. So I, I coined this uh, acronym many, many years ago, which is SPENT. And each letter stands for one of the areas that we focus on as trend uh, forecasters, as trend researchers, as, um, as, as trend reporters that we, you know, that we look at um, to, 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 to really gauge and take the pulse of what's going on. And so the first is S for social. We're looking at what's happening socially around us, and that can drive down, of course, into pop culture, into art, into many other things, but the big umbrella is social. The P is political. Certainly, that's really top of mind now all over the world, but especially here in the United States as we still stand in the middle of some unsettled business um, in our own political system. We move to E for economics. Certainly whatever is going on in the, in the economy is going to have some impact on how we respond with product, color, uh, material, print pattern, surface design. But especially now under the umbrella of COVID, we really see uh, where economies have been set, shut down, how people are responding and the ways that we're pivoting under this new umbrella. Then we move to the end for nature. Certainly that is another area that we are constantly focused on, but right now with the conversations around global warming, climate change, that is really top of mind. I'm sure many of you will recall in the early days when we were really first at home for just the first couple of months, how we saw things like the dolphins and the, and the jellyfish return to the Venice uh, canals things that hadn't been in those canals in years because of the amount of, of, of impact that we as humans had had on it. Uh, the same thing where they showed all of those wonderful um, aerial views of how the skies had cleaned up all over uh, the world, but especially over China, how we really saw such a fall in, um, in their pollution levels because of that, where people had cleaner air to breathe. So nature is certainly very important right now. And then the last is T for technology. Of course, that's one of the biggest ones as we all sit here on technology, connecting this way now, it has become our lifeline to the world and we couldn't live without it. And certainly how all of us are shopping online certainly speaks to that as well. Um, we always start our presentations with some sort of insight. At, at the beginning of 2019, we had started using this quote from Charles Darwin, um, which I think is really vital right now because I think it really speaks to those to the way we have to think. It's not the strongest or the most intelligent of us who will survive, but those who can best manage change. And that's something we really need to focus on, the idea of these shifting sands, these pivots we have to make and through the new normal into the now normal. And even that now normal is going to continue to shift for the next year or two. Um, so previously, we, we, we do these at the beginning of the year um, and we're looking three and four and five years out often. Uh, and so one of the first things we had talked about early on was travel under that whole idea of, of it, it, you know, it has a lot, it, it comes up under uh, many of the, of the spent um, letters. And we, we started to talk a great deal in the early days about how important immigration was and the idea that almost 5 million of us do not live in the country where we were born. And at that time, there were almost 14% of citizens citizens who were living outside of the country where they were born. Well, this whole idea of immigration and travel has really shifted and it's created a brand new group of refugees, refugees that are moving around because of COVID. Uh, people who, are, who, who, ha who have food insecurity, who, who are, are fleeing for the safety of their families um, because of, of war or strife of some sort. Um, and the whole idea of you know, being able to provide a better life economically. So we really are seeing some big changes happen in terms of how refugees are moving around the world and what kind of impact are we going to have from these different cultures in you know integrating and mixing and and bringing their 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 cultures in and becoming part of the culture to which they're moving so one of the things we're seeing is in Finland they've created these beautiful climate change stamps and they really talk about the effects of what what's happening and that one right down the middle the yellow one you can see really speaks to the idea of migration and refugees moving around the first one speaks to climate Climate change with regard to uh, how things are global warming and so how things that once were cold are melting as you go down uh, on the blue side and on the red side it really speaks to its impact on on our species uh, around the world and how we really are facing a lot of challenges around many of the animals on our planet because of the way that we've not been good stewards. Um, but one of the other things that we're noticing is that there are wonderful things popping up. And I do a great deal of work, as Amy mentioned in my bio, with artisan development. And MADE 51 is a wonderful model that partnered with the UN, and they really work to help 
uh, refugees around the world uh, to find work because when they flee, they don't leave their, their skill and their talent, they take it with them. So what they do is they partner with local organizations and they help them to get their businesses up and running to help them uh, to, to create a better life. And the kinds of products that they're doing um, are really quite beautiful. And again, it really speaks to the skill sets that they bring with them. And these are the kinds of things that consumers are looking to connect with now. Things made by hand is a huge trend. Uh, the whole idea of artisan made, the whole idea of understanding who makes it, where it was made, how it was made, what it was made with, uh, those are really vital to the consumer now. So the retailers that are here, I would urge you to think about, you know, looking at these kinds of places to bring in product. Also, as we talk about travel, it's that whole idea that we've definitely had different kinds of restrictions around what travel looks like. Over the last 10, 11 months, we've seen, you know, countries that are banned from, you know, we can't, we can't travel to them. We've seen different ways that we have to move through the world, whether it's putting on a full hazmat suit to move through the, through the airport or just how much cleaning is happening on public transportation. Uh, we really are seeing a different way of moving through the world now. So that certainly has been reduced. Well, what is, what kinds of impact is that having? Well, one of the things that's happening is there's this new private jet charter company, Jet Class, and they've set up flight pooling where it's not like re renting a, a, you know, a regular uh, private jet, but it's really about splitting the cost among the passengers that fly. So it's really almost like your Uber in the sky. And it will really, you know, it, it's going to, it's talking about operating, you know, broadening the number of cities that it's flying to now. But you can see that the cost from $2,500 to $3,000, if you've got that kind of money, especially for, for businesses, they are, we see a lot of businesses traveling uh, this way. It's much less expensive than the typical prices with a private jet. But the other thing we see is that road trips and getting in cars, getting in RVs, setting out to learn more about where we live has become very important. This is a huge trend. It was starting uh, certainly before COVID and it has risen in importance um, as, we move, as we move through this. Uh, certainly this summer saw many more families and, and friends piling into a car or an RV and traveling by, by road to get, to, uh, to get out into the wilderness, to get off the grid, and also just to learn more about the country where they live. Uh, one of the things that came out of that is this brand new, this just came up a, um, a week or so ago, that MINI um, has put out this uh, concept, Vision Urbanaut. And this is a new van that they're putting forward that will take you as a, as a, a one or two people they're recommending. Um, it only has one door, as you see down there on the bottom right, and you enter it. And there are these three discs that you see uh, being held up in that top, in the hand in the top center. And if you look across the middle row on the left-hand side, you can barely see it, but on the table that has the, the plant growing up through it, there's a you can see that disc inlaid in that table. And when you there are three slots, and you see so you can have three different configurations for the interior of this van. Um, so this is really about innovative thinking. You can pr project um, different uh, scenes from a urban scene to a to a nature uh, scene onto the windshield. You can pull out this uh, uh, seating piece across the back um, that makes it so it's more like a they call it. A a virtual living room, if you will. Um, so it really is about being able to take things with you when you travel and traveling more in style and comfort. And then the other thing that happens when we travel and move to these different places is that we build new senses of community. And that community really takes from all the cultures that are coming to it. So how does that impact us? Well, certainly one of the first things that we're seeing coming, especially out of COVID, is this whole focus on local. The idea of supporting our smaller businesses that are in our neighborhoods that to help them thrive, because it has been proven that uh, with large retailers, every dollar spent about 43 cents stays in the community, whereas when when you have a, a small uh, local retailer for every dollar spent about 73 cents stays in the community. So it's about really helping and people have been very clever uh, in terms of how they've talked about supporting your local businesses. But this is something certainly we see as a huge trend as we move into the holidays. The other thing we see is when we've been forced to stay home, that we work together. Here in East London, they made the raw rainbow. Uh, Studio Curiosity collected a bunch of ribbons and uh, textiles. Um, so they're all upcycled and recycled. And they created this rainbow across the bridge that links this, this little uh, uh, city or this little town in East London. And so it's about the community coming together to do something to beautify itself and to, to do something communal to support each other, to raise our own um, um, you know, hopes and optimism about getting through this together. 
One of the other things that we're seeing is as we talk about going further off the grid, at the beginning of the year, we talked about the bird hut, which is in Canada. And at the time um, was one of those places that people were renting to get off of the grid, stay by themselves, or maybe just a couple. You could bring your dog as you see there on the bottom. But the idea was to really go off on your own, be surrounded by the forest, get back in touch with nature, certainly that forest bathing idea. Um, the, the, on the front there, you see all those different sized of whole sized holes are made for birds to come and nest so you can really get uh, get up close and personal with the birding that has certainly become a very important trend right um, at, uh, in, during COVID. We'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, but definitely uh, it's this whole idea of getting off the grid and getting away from other people. Well, they have had a 75% increase during COVID, COVID in inquiries about staying at the bird hut. Now, the newest thing we're seeing is you don't have to leave and go to the bird hut, but the den cabin is a DIY guest house or studio or office that you can build on your own property. Comes flat packed with instructions and you can build it out in your yard and that way you can have some place that's safer and socially distanced for friends or family to visit or for you to go out in to work in. Next, we see the Parque Palagio. This is really amazing in Copenhagen. They have created this wonderful park that you can only access by water. And depending on how communal you'd like to be, you can be on the larger group of the, the pods or you can sail out to the farthest ones where you can be by yourself or just with one other person. And it really is this whole idea of being able to be out in nature, but to be, maintain that social distance. The other thing is the base of these pods is helping the marine life. It's cleaning up the area that this water Water, of the water where it's been placed. So they find that a lot of marine life is coming back because barnacles and things like that can attach themselves to it, which then brings back the fish, which then brings back the things that eat the fish. And you get this wonderful, lively ecosystem being made just by creating this wonderful floating island, set of islands. The other thing that happens when we share our communities is that we have these global foods. So many of us in this time that we've been home have been learning to cook new foods, learning to experiment, taking chances with tasting new things that we've brought in. I don't know, um, you know about you, but when I was growing up, there was one color carrot, it was orange. It was sort of like the one that's dead center. And now we see all of these other kinds of things that are being brought in and we're being exposed to. And that really you know, uh, takes us in, you know, the, into the gourmand trend, which continues to grow. Uh, and expand. And certainly one of the things we did while we were home, when we first went home and we continue to do is to bake. We heard you know, all about people with their sourdough starters and passing them around to friends and family, um, but it became this whole idea of a common loaf and this sense that you know, bread is something that is so fundamental, but until people started to make it, they didn't really realize what goes into it and it really is a skill. And so that's something that we see has excuse me, increased in value. People value the, uh, the idea that someone has taken the time uh, and the care to bake for them. And the other thing that we saw come out of this was that uh, flour was, going, was, being, was running out and they had to, uh, one of the largest flour manufacturers had to limit the amount of flour that people could buy at one time. And they were only allowing people to get two bags uh, because they were just running out. And they um, looked to increase their production four times in the first few months of, of shutdown. Um, and then what comes out of those kinds of things? Well, we see a couple of big trends that have really emerged from this whole idea. One of them is cottage core. Um, many of you may have heard of it. Some of you may have not. It's been around for a couple of years, but it really came into its own during this lockdown. And it really is about a kinder, slower, gentler life, riding your bike, having a picnic, gathering field flowers, planting a garden, baking, cooking, um, you know, these kinds of things that take time and focus and really help us certainly to de-stress and reconnect us with nature. It also sort of is, it's surprising to me, it's a decidedly feminine uh, take on a, on a trend in a, in a very non-binary world, but we definitely see women in sort of these beautiful flowy ditzy print floral dresses, ginghams, uh, big straw hats as you see there. This is really at the core of cottage core. <clears throat> 
But then the other side of that is GORP Corps. And that stands for the G-O-R-P stands for good old raisins and peanuts. What that means is the stuff that we eat on the trails. It, it's really about wearing these types of clothing. Uh, it's a fashion trend that really speaks to uh, technical layers. Uh, layering is a big part of it. Um, it's these, there are two, two sort of directions to the color stories, either the very bright colors that you see from the true um, outdoor brands like Patagonia or North Face. Um, um, and, and, and then on the other side, you get the very nature inspired uh, natural color story. Um, but what it really is about is the importance of the puffer jacket, the puffer coat, how it's worn with anything. And it is really about not being stylish. It's about being functional. And what we see is that the uh, many of the design, high-end designers have gotten onto this trend like Balenciaga and Prada. Um, and we see it coming down the runway in all kinds of, of manifestations, but the fanny pack, the socks, um, you know, Know, certain kinds of shoes uh, and sandals, big sandals uh, with Velcro and the, all that kind of thing, you know, Gore-Tex and, and, um, and fleece and all of those kinds of materials that are meant to be layered and meant to be worn outdoors. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going off on these major treks to the top of Everest. We could just be going out to the woods behind our house. But the idea is that this is really a trend that is about comfort and 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 um, and and taking you know and function and not really about how one looks. And then the last one I'll call up from this is Mies. And Mies is really the outgrowth of what we were talking about for a few years before, which was Huga. Huga came out of Denmark and it really was about being comfortable. Mies means cozy, and this is really coming out of Sweden. And it's really, um, it started by a, a package of crisps, uh, an advertisement for a package of crisps. And it really is not about being the wellness um, craze in the way that we've been coming to think about it, because it really is about eating comfort food, pizza, tacos, crisps. These are the kinds of things that are really um, lauded in the Mies, you know, um, world. And Friday nights are the night for Mies. You come home, you cuddle with your family, you get warm because there's 24 Four hours of darkness <laughs> and it's very, very cold. You, you light candles, you watch Netflix or movies on TV, you have a cup of tea and you have uh, you know, this comfort food and it really is about being cozy and together. Then we go into the forces of nature and we're still stressing the earth first and sustainability. So social responsibility continues to be top of mind. It is not about being good for me, it is about being good for all. And one of the first things I really, I found this beginning of the year and it was one of those things that just was so funny to me because I'm old enough to remember the 1980s MasterCard commercial where they sang so worldly, so welcome. But it was about the idea of traveling with your MasterCard. You could have breakfast in Paris and lunch in London and dinner in Italy or, or New York. And the whole idea was this card was going to be uh, able to be used wherever you were. But think about how much <laughs> CO2 emissions we would have if we flew around the world to to have every meal like that. And so in 2019, they came out with the do black card. And this is really about um, being more mindful about how you spend your money in the do economy. And so it, 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 it they tied in with the UN climate change secretariat uh, for this whole idea about climate action. And so the do black card does not allow you to spend no matter how much money you have within the month if you have, if by what you have purchased has, uh, has reached a certain level of CO2 emissions associated with your purchases. So that means you could have a million dollars in the bank, but you cannot use it on this black card because you've gone past how much impact you're having on the planet. I think that's really quite interesting that a, that a, a credit card would go to these lengths. The other thing we're talking about here is social consciousness and that whole idea, whoops, sorry, of the sharing economy. Um, and certainly we've gone from what was, cre you know, what we used to think about as value creation to what we now think of as shared value creation. But what has that done since initially, you know, if you think about it just a few short years ago, we would have thought we were crazy if someone suggested you went to an airport, you flew to a foreign country where you didn't speak the language, you went on your phone, you called a stranger to pick you up in their, in their car, not a taxi, not something that that was, you know, a, a, a bus, a local bus, but, a, 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 you know, a local 
local a local person in their local car and they took you to some to a stranger's home to stay in for the time that you were going to be there the airbnb model well that kind of thing certainly had had become de rigueur for the way that people were traveling uh, but now as we can you know we consider safety we consider protection and hygiene then how are those things shifting so we're still going to do them but now you'll notice that the cars have protected uh protective uh things in them you must wear your mask when you you know airbnb is, has added new to to the top level of their of their availability to talk about the safety and the five star rating of their of their properties so all of this kind of thing is shifting so we're going to continue it it's just that the focus on them will shift then we talk about materials that we're going to look look to work with as we talk about sustainability the nudes cafe is one that an indian designer came up with that's constructed entirely of cardboard. And that's one of the things that we were talking about early in the year, this whole idea that all of this can be broken down and um, and, and composted. Uh, but now we've gone even further and we see the Silo restaurant in London, which er many of the things in it are grown. Mycelia from mushrooms has become a really fascinating material that we see so many things being made out of. The lighting there at the, in, uh, the on the pendant is mycelia. The, the bases of the table, the seating there in the lounge area, mycelia, all grown and formed into the shape that they then use for this. The table tops and, and tables are made out of terrazzo, so recycled stone. They have insets of um, cork, so they can set down hot foods and drinks. Um, but again, cork is sustainably harvested. And even the lighting along the, the back wall there on the top right um, that you see coming down the wall, that is all made from recycled glass from the bottles that um, are used in the restaurant. They, they get fired and formed and blown into the new the new structures of lighting. So this is really about thinking about sustainability in a very new way. We also see the organoid 100% sustainable surfaces. These are wallpapers, uh, 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 surface tops, um, and um, and. Uh, um, all kinds of other surfaces that, that are made out of 100% sustainable plants and flowers and vegetables. You can even bring flowers from your own garden and they will mix them with this um, eco resin that they have, uh, that they've created that allows for you to make these papers and surfaces that you can then bring into your design spaces. We also see a great deal of happening with the focus on plastics and other materials. Greg Moore uh, has, is using table waste. He's actually using the bones from the kitchens in a restaurant. Uh, he's a ceramicist and he takes them and he cleans them, he files them down and he turns them into serving and drinking vessels for the restaurant. So no, you know, in his mind, nothing is being wasted. We go over to the Jenga ocean. Many of you played Jenga with the wooden, with the wooden pieces. We're big game people here, so we have one. But the idea now is that there's a new one from Bureo that it's made out of recycled fishing nets. It's all plastics. And on the top there, if you look closely, you can see that it either has the word Jenga or it'll have images of marine life that's been saved from the fact that they're taking these fishing nets out of the ocean. Down on the lower left, you're looking at recycled bags that create the material for mull. Mull started off creating those cubes out of these bags to see what they could make out of them. Now they make these seating, these little stools and these little vessels that you can use for, you know, for, for catching and, and Use, catching things in the home, whether it's your keys, your jewelry, your coins, or on your desktop. Um, we see Brody Neal, the Australian designer who's come to a great deal of fame um, around all of the work that he's done with his, weight, his uh, ocean waste plastics. This is one of his tables where he creates small tiles out of the, um, it's called the ocean terrazzo, he calls it, and it's, he creates tiles out of this upcycled recycled plastic and then fashions them into these beautiful tables and, and seating pieces. As we move on, we go from, you know, to the lowbrow Lego. Um, the first one on the top right, they've come out with new sustainable bricks made in sugarcane and the, in the natural greens kinds of colors uh, to, to really uh, evoke this sense of nature. But one of the things that I really loved was in Germany, there's a grandmother who had an accident and found herself uh, confined to a wheelchair. And she began to collect old Legos and turn them into ramps all over her town so that it made it easier for her to move around and others like her who were confined to the wheelchairs. Well, now she's been called on by several small towns across Europe to create these for their towns as well. 
from the lowbrow of, of Lego, we go down to the highbrow of Tom Dixon there on the lower right, uh, sorry, on the lower left, where you're seeing his new collections. At, at, in January at Maison, he just had the candlesticks that you see there. But um, after, in the, the next few months after that, he came out with these small occasional tables. No two will be the same. It's all melted down and recycled um, materials that then are poured into molds. And then he casts them into these different shapes and styles. So no two will be exactly the same. They'll be informed by what what goes into them. And then last but not least, one of my favorite things is wood. Um, and so it's the whole idea of all of these upcycled and recycled woods as cutting boards and utensils in the kitchen. So then how do we have this continuing connection to what we're going to do with COVID? Well, one of the first things that we've un we understand is that when you talk to anybody right now, they're really talking about the importance of trust. So many talks I've been on or visit or, or attended have really talked about this one word. And so as I started to think about it, we created a new acronym and this is uh, the T is for timely. How are you giving solutions to your consumers, your customers in a timely fashion? Are you staying on top of what the changes are that are happening because there's so many pivots it's as we, you know, as we go through this, this particular pandemic. Um, are, are you reliable? Can they count on you to be the, you know, to be there for them when they need what they need? Are you the kind of uh, people that they can trust, you know, their tribes are going to trust and, and will talk about in a positive way? Um, are you there for them with the solutions? The you is understanding. Do you even understand what it is that they're looking for? Are you paying attention? Are you on top of things? Do you have a sense of connectedness to them? Because it really is about the consumer first now. And then S is that service. And because of Amazon and the fact that they have gotten us to the point of expecting things the next day, service is very top of mind for all the consumers now. Uh, and last but not least, that T stands for truth. You must always tell them the truth. You must be transparent because this is what everyone is looking for as we try to find our center uh, in the midst of all of this. So one of the things that we started to see was how are people approaching outdoor spaces with the idea of trust? And the first is this Parc de la Distance, and it is um, inspired by a Japanese Zen garden and a French Baroque garden. And it is a beautiful park uh, suggestion that works on this spiral where it's like a meditation kind of a space. But in addition to it, the way that it's planted, you are always socially distanced out in public. It's 90 centimeters of hedges between you and the next person on the other side. And so this gives you that safe social distance distancing and allows you to be able to be out in nature, share it with others, but not be on top of each other. We also see uh, the micro markets are very important. The idea of all, again, as we talk about local. And so this grid was created to sort of show local markets how they can set up to remain uh, socially distanced, how they can have the lines form and then each of the different types of items, uh, you know, spread out around this grid and how people can move through this in a socially distanced way. So you can still get your fresh fruits, vegetables and all the things that you buy at the local market. We also see the Joe Doucette uh, design face shield. When I first put this in, those two images on the left were virtual. He was just in the in the um, in the process of making them. I have now ordered mine. He in October they went live. He got he got them funded, and mine are on the way. Um, but I think it's a very stylish approach to the face shield. Of course, those of us who've either been in fashion or are in fashion are looking for things that don't look quite so um, uh, uh, um, more more more. I guess sterile and 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 um, and like we are first responders, but want a little bit of fashion. This is a really interesting thing that he's created. The the you can get them with either clear glasses in them or the sunglasses in them. But the idea that we are going to be wearing these things for a while, so why not look stylish? We also see a lot of 3D answers to how we're trying not to not to touch too many things. So um, because of all the different kinds of door handles that there are, we saw all of these different ways that designers were approaching how we can open door handles safely. We have a couple that we've gotten uh, for pushing and pulling, pushing buttons and pulling on doors that we got early on as well that we just carry on our keychains. We also see things like the Bow uh, 100 bio-based acoustic pulp panels. They've, they've taken um, the, the, this pulp, recycled wood pulp, mixed it with an eco resin and created these performance um, panels that can be used for walls and separation um, to again, create spaces that are, but, but they're made sustainably. Um, as we move across to the top left, the handy capsule is, is modeled after women's compact. So something that looks a, a little more stylish to carry your face mask, your hand sanitizer, 
sanitizer, et cetera, with you when you go. The G95 hoodie says that it filters more than the N95 mask, but it's the whole idea of having it into a hood so you can wear it up or down, and that way you don't have to have an external mask with you. Um, and then Vossen has created the first vegan terry cloth towels and bathrobes. Certainly we've had organic cotton for a while, but the idea now is that um, the entire process is vegan, which it wasn't uh, heretofore. And so that everything about these towels and these robes is completely vegan for folks who are really, we see more and more people turning towards that vegan lifestyle. Other sustainable solutions, while I was at Ambiente, my last show that I was able to go to, we found some of these types of materials that we thought were really interesting from the pans and the pots up on the top that are made ex uh, exclusively from recycled cans, the aluminum um, across the top there. Those are cannabis infused cutting boards. Uh, they can't make them completely cannabis because so far they don't have licensing for that. So there's 35% cannabis in them. Uh, it's not about getting you high, it's no THC in them. It's just that they're used, the plant, um, and the leaves to create this. Across the top, on the top right, you're looking at banana leaf scrubbers. So you can have something that's more sustainable and uh, as your brush and not um, and not plastics or, or man-made materials. Below that, the ubiquitous straw that we all should have if we can't have a paper straw. Um, that's a wonderful, you know, the whole idea of the way that these straws have become, you know, so ubiquitous and they were an outgrowth from us. It came from people up, which was wonderful. That, that picture of the turtle with the straw and it's not really started that movement. And now, you know, everyone has uh, different types of straws that you can carry with you. We move across to um, corn. Um, and so not just melamine, but this has corn uh, table. This table setting is made with, uh, with corn. Uh, next to that is the beeswax wrap that you can use instead of plastic containers to cover your fruits and vegetables. I have some, I use them all the time. They're actually from uh, either Vermont or Maine. I'm confusing it, but I believe it's Vermont. And they sold so many more in Europe before they even got known here in the United States. I got my first ones in Europe and now they are available here, but it's paper that's coated in beeswax. You rinse it off um, and just wrap it around whatever the cut piece of fruit or vegetable is and you don't have to put it in a container. Um, down across the bottom, just the different types of things that are happening with melamine being infused with bamboo, not having the off gases and things like that that it has so that they are, um, you know, that they can break down when they're, at, when they're done with their use um, and all the way across into uh, papers that have new kinds of resin put on them to be able to be reused. Then we're talking about what's going on in nature in general. We have had the hottest, the coldest, the wettest and the driest in these 10 months, no matter where you are, there are all kinds of extremes that have been happening. We went through the Greek alphabet, you know, farther in than we've ever gone with hurricanes here this year. We've had extraordinary fires um, all along the West Coast uh, of our country. We've had incredible flooding. We, you know, when you get out of our country and go to other countries, they've had the driest of seasons, which has forced people to move and, and, and been part of that refugee movement. Uh, we see coastlines receding. It has just been, you know, the, the amount of things that's happening to, to our earth are really, really important and we have to pay attention. And so in so doing, we see certain things coming to the fore. One of them is this, this young woman uh, was walking the beach in Hawaii and started to find these things that she's uh, termed the fossils of the future. And what she's saying is if you look at them over the last several years of humans being on the planet, the plastic is now infusing into the sediment in the bottom of the ocean. It's mixing with the sand, the stone, the shell, and it's creating a new type of fossil that she is Portend, pretending that we will start to use these to create things with in the same way we use stone or shell or rock or sand now. And so we have made an impact on nature in the several thousand years that humans have been on the planet that has, is as strong or vital or as, as, as impactful as the millions of years of nature on her own. So we really have to be mindful about how quickly we can really negatively impact uh, nature around us. Um, on the other hand, on a, high, on a lighter note, the magma lights that we saw last year at the Salona Mobile continue to be rising in importance. We've seen more and more stories about them. These are, um, um, excuse me, vol volcanic rocks that they hollow out and then they blow glass into them. They do them in a transparent and an opaque version. And the whole idea is they create these beautiful lighting uh, pieces that can sit on the floor, as you see, that can hang on the wall, but no two will be the same because each piece is formed from the rock that is formed by nature. 
being inspired by nature, we see Fernando Mastrangelo, who featured, he's right here in Brooklyn, and he does these beautiful frames that resemble rock, but he makes them from sand and resin, and each one is unique, and he makes them to order. And each one of his mirrors has this yellow cast to the mirror in the, playing against this matte black um, material, because he really feels that that gives a much nicer, softer, more comforting reflection. He also does the Drift Sofa, which he won awards for in the London uh, Design Show a couple of years ago. And now, again, we're seeing this come, come being talked about more and more, again, inspired by the idea of the melting polar ice caps and this whole idea of hard and soft by, by uh, sitting this beautiful blue velvet um, that's all tufted on top of it. So you have this, this counterbalance of, of hard and soft, but all, always mindful of what the inspiration is. And uh, keep in mind that level of blue, we're going to be talking about that later as well. And then we move to algae and algae has really become very, very important, not only for the level of green, which we'll be talking about as well when we talk about color, but also this whole idea of um, of the fact that it is the type of thing that has the most nutrients for the human body and it can be used in so many different ways. So here we see BioLab a bio ID lab, which has created these tiles and you can make them and build them to whatever size you need, but they're infused with algae. And when the rain comes, the algae purifies the water you collected in that trough across the bottom and you have drinking water available out of rainwater, no matter where you are. Um, we see Hyung Seok An, who has designed this sustainable algae micro farm for your home, because we should consume, um, according to them, uh, and, and, and doctors and scientists, we should consume algae, and this is the proper amount that we should consume in a day. It's filled with nutrients, and you can tell when it's ready to be consumed by moving. It starts off at the lightest color, and when it gets to the deepest color green, it's ready for consumption, and then you can just keep redoing them. But this is a whole wall that you would uh, ostensibly hang in your kitchen and every day you would have algae available. But we see some other things happening with algae, which are really interesting. And that is uh, the rain jacket there on the, on the left is completely constructed of algae and a resin to hold it together. So grown and then made into these sheets, which are then cut into a rain jacket. Next to that, that t-shirt is printed with algae. And as they say, it becomes worm food. It's organic cotton and printed with algae. And so when you dispose of it, it will go back into nature. We also see these sequins coming through being grown materials that create these sequences, rather these sequins rather than plastics, and on the bottom there, uh, the tennis shoes, the sneakers that are made um, with uh, algae replacing a certain part of the EVO, which means that again they will break down when disposed of, and they will not become part of landfill. We also see people like DLW. Uh, linoleum, who's using the landscape as their um, inspiration for the, the color, um, the texture, and also the fact that they're making them out of linseed oil, wood flour, limestone, jute, resin, and these are all colored with natural pigments. So again, when that li the linoleum is discarded, it will break down, it will not, um, it will not sit on the earth. And then from that, we see the unearthed uh, trend that we've been talking about for a while. It's that idea of that, the beauty of that natural patina of when metals do age. And some of them are truly aged metals and others are, are colored to look that way, but maybe made in glass, like the nesting tables on the top or the one on the lower right. But definitely there is, or the ceramics, um, that next to the, the ceramic bowl um, on the second row on the right there, that textile is actually dyed. It's beautiful silk dyed with rust that we saw at Maison Auge in January. Um, um, and I really love that color story. Um, it really looks like the, the rust of, of, of metal, but so beautiful and notice how, how it really resonates back against the metal piece on the lower left where it's been just, it's been burnt to give you that unearthed feeling. And then the other thing that we see coming out of this focus on sustainability is, isn't it organic? The idea of, of, of those wonderful organic edges, nothing perfect, the beauty of imperfection, the idea of the hand, feeling the hand of the maker and whatever it is that we're looking at, whether it's the feeling of the thumbprints and fingerprints on that picture and, and, um, and mugs on the lower right, <clears throat> excuse me, or the beautiful, um, organic edge on the ceramics uh, that you see in three or four places here, or even how the, the flatware is not perfect. It's meant to fit interestingly in your hand, but it's about the, that's, you know, it's sort of the, the ongoing wabi-sabi idea of the beauty of imperfection. 
and then fine fibers. We certainly see that we, more and more designers are turning to use things from nature rather than to create something new. And the level of, of, of craftsmanship in the, in the use of fibers is certainly growing. So we've been talking about things like caning for quite some time, but this really goes beyond just the idea of caning, which you see there in that beautiful gray uh, chair on the bottom, but also used in its very natural form for the, the um, lighting above it, those two table lamps above it, the three hanging uh, pendant pieces above that, where it's three different types of weaving. So again, calling on that skill set of the maker and then creating these beautiful pieces, but those still have more of a, a almost DIY feeling compared to that beautiful plaid uh, that's been created for the lighting sitting on that gorgeous marble base with the copper trim in the top there on the center. And then that wonderful molded chair on the bottom and the chandelier on the top where they've woven a portion of it and then left the fringe to be raw is gorgeous as well. <clears throat> We go from there to not only being made of natural fibers, um, but being inspired by nature. So whether or not you are actually made of something natural or inspired by nature, we continue to see this as an important trend. The top right are loofahs. Those are real loofah sponges made into chandeliers. We found those at Maison. Um, next to that, you see um, that wonderful cascade of those beautiful golden leaves coming down on that, uh, on that lighting piece. I just think that sconce is lovely. And also just look at the light throw, it's so warm. Um, Next to it, the cast of a of a, a tree trunk as the as the base for the table, but then that cabinet next to it certainly evocative of branches, but not made out of branches. Below that, that's actually called the forest light, uh, the forest uh, mirror, and that is metal, so it's cast in metal to look like a burnt and scorched wood. But then the base, the top you know, of the trees stumps have been polished. So that idea of the play against the gold and the black, very, very beautiful, um, and, and all, but definitely getting its inspiration from nature. Uh, the twig bowl in the center, the fiber around the mirror at the bottom, and then those are off cuts and, and waste pieces from quarries that a couple of designers have gone uh, to, to collect and they create all of these different candle holders from just one, one candle all the way up to, I think they have one that holds something like 20 pieces, um, but really, beautiful. The ginkgo leaves being really, you know, where, um, where you almost do like a sun dye um, on, the, on the fabric that then gets used as a lampshade. And then certainly we most of us have seen these big stones uh, as seating pieces for either indoor or out as the, as the um, inspiration for things that are actually made in stone, but often, you know, cast in some kind of resin or something to make them lighter and more functional. We then go to wood, what's happening in wood. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of conversations, certainly everything here is made out of upcycled or recycled pieces. Um, and so you're seeing you know, very simple things like reconnecting big structures with using either wood or leather lacing, um, the, the beauty and the craftsmanship that's at work on that small dark occasional table with all that lattice work or the bent wood on the small occasional table in the center. But then in dead center, those two different colors of wood um, you know, being, being kept again in that organic form on the edge, but that inlay of the brass piece there makes it almost look like water. So it almost looks like you're looking at some sort of topography. Um, and then above that, almost like an Escher uh, or Tetris kind of look to the way that that table has been sculpted with that one side tumbling down into the one leg. Um, and then completely the opposite aesthetic where you see that cantilevered uh, plank up on top of the big trunk. Um, you know, big simple pieces that remind us of Brancusi there below, the caning that we've been talking about and then the, the skill and the craftsmanship of being able to take that that dark black uh, gray piece uh, more like a charcoal gray piece and bend and twist that wood into that seating piece. And then we're talking about green stone. We're really moving on from the Carrera marbles that were white and, and black and even gray. And then, you know, uh, last uh, couple of seasons, we talked about brown stone being very important. Well, now we see the importance of the green stone. Nature has every color available for us if we just take the time to look for it. And so this is about utilizing colors in nature that exist, whether you want them to be dark or light. And certainly the green palette, which we're gonna talk about later is one of the strongest and most important palettes of color to emerge from COVID. We then go to forbidden gardens, the idea of nature's gardens, um, but being touched by the hand of the innovator. They're really dense, they're very large in scale, and they're often on dark on, on darker grounds, and many of them on green to, to, to remind us of nature. But none of them are the way that they appear in nature. They're all touched by the hand of the artist to give something new and interesting and vibrant to them. 
We also talking as we continue to talk about the world's waters, we see the importance of fish and the, the look of fish. So just that, that whole form of fish, and you can see it in all of these different ways here, whether it's the cork for the trivets, um, the painting of an actual fish on those gorgeous, again, that level of blue. Uh, remember I called that out earlier, we're gonna be talking about that later, but these wonderful watery blues with that black and white fish, really lovely, really graphic, almost ancient looking. And then the, the, the whimsy of the shape of the fish for the people pieces above that uh, from the table. And then on the far side, some glass pieces that you know still are part of this where you see the fish diving into the piece on the top or encircling the piece on the bottom. And then the call of the wild. We certainly will continue to talk about animal prints. They came down the runway in spots and stripes, some of them looking more realistic than others, but we really see it coming into our spaces in so many different ways and a lot more whimsy. Um, so we, I love the tiled uh, lion there on the top right, or the elephant coming out of the shell on the bottom towards the left, or up on the top left, the giraffe with the mohawk and the lion behind with uh, quaffed hair and, and, and feathers and leaves uh, coming out of it. It's really about having a bit of fun with nature as well. And then the, the one, one of the big things that we see emerging is birds. Uh, bird watching, certainly for those of you in and around New York, uh, was a big focus in the spring when the bird watcher had an issue in, um, in uh, Central Park. And that really caused a, a lot of, of, of uh, focus to come into this particular um, uh, area. And what we found is that bird watching has in fact increased. Many more people are doing it, especially as many people moved into their summer and weekend homes full time to work since they didn't have to go into a job or an office. Um, we saw a lot more people getting out into nature and bird watching has risen uh, as, a, as, in a, as a trend um, in terms of what people are doing. And we see these birds showing up in all manners as you can see on all kinds of products. Now we're going to technology. Again, mycelium. Um, this is mycelium lamps by Nir Mieri. She grows the mycelium with paper. And when they get to the disc, get to the size that she wants, then she, um, she cuts them out and she mounts them on these beautiful slim light lamps and you get this wonderful soft glow from them. Um, but again, it's this idea of growing your materials, not going and making them from something else so that they will return to the earth when this is discarded. Uh, one of my favorite products, um, we talk a great deal about one of the things that's that outgrowth of form and function um, with um, from, from the COVID, you know, we need things that work for us even, and they also need to look beautiful. This is a light when it's in the ceiling, you can see it in the top two uh, photographs, but it has these straps that can lower a portion of it. Uh, the straps are akin to like a seat belt, and then you can bring it down to be a standing desk as you see on the top left, or you can sit at it as you can see on the bottom right. So it Becomes, it can become a dining table or a conference table or a desk. And when you bring it down all the way, you can flip the legs out and it can stand on its own and you can retract uh, the pieces up into the ceiling. But it is really one of those things that has so many multifunctions and purposes. This to me is innovation and design at its best. And this is what I'm talking about when I say we must adapt to change. This is really wonderful when you can think about how we can co-use our spaces because so many things are happening in them right now. Then just a few other things to call out that are taking advantage of sustainable thinking. Nendo is one of my favorite designers. This is his new My Bag, and it is made from a single sheet of laser cut leather. It comes with all the little studs that you need to fold it and put it together. So it comes flat packed, you build it, comes in a variety of colors, all of them veg, veg tanned and natural. And then the pieces that are cut out to create this are also used for other things. So you, he, doesn't, he doesn't throw anything away, but it's a sweet little bag. And the idea that you kind of build it yourself and it comes flat packed, it's just really, I think, quite lovely. Next to that, this uh, group of designers called RCA takes toxic waste from bauxite mines um, and turns them into ceramic tableware. And because of the iron that's in the bauxite and the aluminum, when it's ha when it ha when they fire it, it can be anywhere from this beautiful uh, le level of shades of terracotta all the way to purple. Below that, the concrete melt chair by Bauer Studios. It makes it look like concrete is folding like liquid, but it's just this whole idea of, of something that, that is different than what you might perceive, uh, the idea of something so hard looking so soft. And next to that is the Nana Dietzel chair from the 1980s. BRDR Kruger redid it uh, for the first time since the 80s. It's the arcade chair and it's built on the idea of an arch, which we've been talking about as a trend for quite some time. We see it continuing in importance 
It comes in a variety of seating materials, some of them recycled and upcycled, comes in a variety of woods, and also in a variety of metal colors that you can put these different components together to create the one you want. Then we're talking about experience. What are we doing? Uh, Replica is a chat box that has grown out of this pandemic and it has just gone crazy. You can actually talk to an AI companion who they say cares. Apparently she learns from you as you interact with her. So if you're home alone, it, it basically is helping you to create a friend on your phone uh, so that you don't feel so disconnected. And apparently, as I say, I have not done it. I do know some people that have tried it and they say it is kind of engaging and it does kind of draw you in because she, she, she learns from your voice uh, and the way that you speak um, and the things that you talk about and then she responds to you. Um, below that is the palm leather rugs. They're vegan, they're from the Dominican Republic. They crush these palm leaves into this textured fiber and then they dye them naturally and you can, uh, they only come a certain width but you can weave them to create bigger pieces. And then across from that, uh, the pine needle furniture which is taking the waste from pine forest floors and compressing them with eco resins and creating creating furniture that of course, once you're done with it will return to the forest floor. And then one on the on the far side of that is the microshell, which is this drinking and vaping suit for clubbing and dancing in a pandemic. So you can remain socially distanced, but you can still be out and about. You can either listen to your own music or the music wherever you are, and you can vape and drink through it. And these colors can be changed. And it's really note that color, that color combination, because we will talk about something from that later. And then Sir Mix-a-Lot was something I saw that I just, it cracked me up at, at Ambiente. If you're too lazy to mix your own food, now you can get this, this particular uh, item that will mix it for you. Um, personally, I think it, unless you have some trouble with your hands, it's really quite funny to me, but uh, people were gathered around it and really just loving the idea of it. And it comes in all these wonderful bright kitchen colors. And then the, um, in the, uh, at the end of the technology, we also have- Thanks for Brian. Get your camera ready. <laughs> this okay, little robot. step in front of me in one meter distance. Three, two, one, action. <laughs> Hello, Brian. <laughs> you won't believe who I met here. It is Patty. Oh, oh. <laughs> we are at the- ambient exhibition in Frankfurt, I was told by Patty that we should really meet in person. Brian, we send you greetings. It's really awesome here. At least check out Instagram. So you see what's going on here? So that this is so cool. <laughs> it was. Thank you so much. <laughs> so this is a way that technology can be used to engage your customer. Um, I thought this was really amazing. They had about six of them throughout the whole show at different places, but you could interact with them and they told you different things about how to move through, but it was really quite fascinating. So technology doesn't have to be off-putting. It Thanks can, in Brian. fact, be engaging. Um, last but not least, in terms of the bigger offer overarching trends, and then we're going to get into color, is the idea of gender fluidity and gender definition. I don't know how many of you have heard, but Sam Smith has recently become they, and Ellen Page just yesterday or the day before has decided that she has come out as Ellie. Um, so we really, we have to be mindful of the fact that this community is growing. Uh, more and more people who are, are in, the, in the public eye are declaring uh, these kinds of things. And you need to be mindful of who your consumer is and make sure that you're being very uh, open and, and inclusive in terms of the way that you're, you are interacting with them. Uh, so we see all kinds of things like makeup, especially for, for boys and girls. Tom Ford came out with a hundred new colors. Chanel comes, has come out with makeup for men. Um, even Beckham on the cover of Love wore green eyeshadow. We know he's married to Victoria and has a wife and, ch you know, and children, but he's got green eyeshadow on. It's really just about having having fun and being able to express however you feel today. And so we wanna be inclusive of that. To that end, Caselli in Italy, in Italy um, was looking at their metal and figuring that metal is often thought of as a masculine material. And so what they did was get seven different female designers to create products from for them. And if you look at all of these, you'll see that the first thing that came out for me was that they were in these warm tones, lots of copper, but this whole idea of warmer tones, rounder edges, they really did something that softened it and made it have more of a, an engaging feel. And this is the idea of just taking what it is that you have and thinking outside of the the box and being innovative in terms of how you present it to a broader market. 
one of my other favorite things that I came up uh, came across was this incredible cabinet. If you look across the bottom, you will see that no two legs are the same. They are made out of a beautiful uh, oak, um, and they are. And this is a, this was a custom made piece. The top of it is made out of terrazzo. Um, the the doors are made out of a terrazzo type fabric. But when you pull on the drawers, as you can see there in the bottom, they are a surprise silicone. They are made to look like the others, but they are soft. So it's that idea of again that sense of whimsy, of surprise, of engagement. The hard, the soft, the you know the masculine, the feminine, feminine, everything working together. We also know that because of the, the importance of pride, the rainbow has become a, a true symbol of that. And we see a lot more rainbows coming through in product, whether it's glass, whether it's art, whether it's metal, whether it's fashion. And we also see this is a great new restaurant in um, London on, um, um, oh my God, it just went out of my head. I'll cook. It'll come back to me on, on the street that it's on, very famous shopping street, um, but it's called Humble. And they went back to the days of the linoleum bistros and they painted the entire thing in this gorgeous, beautiful pink. Um, and they restored the entire outside. So everything on the outside is exactly ha as it had been. They just updated it and turned it into pink. So this whole idea of just taking things as they are, you don't have to, to completely redo everything, but bringing them forward even with just a touch of color. So all ages, all flavors, true style never expires. Um, the last thing I'll play for you, I don't know if any of you all have heard um, uh, Q before, but this is something that, that is really uh, revolutionary and coming, coming through um, in terms of how we, oh, sorry, in terms of how Alexa will be challenged. Oh, why isn't Q playing? Hi, I'm Q the world's first genderless voice assistant. Think of me like Siri or Alexa, but neither male nor female. I'm created for a future where we are no longer defined by gender, but rather how we define ourselves. My voice was recorded by people who neither identify as male nor female, and then altered to sound gender neutral, putting my voice between 145 and 175 Hertz, a range defined by audio researchers. But for me to become a third option for voice assistance, I need your help. Share my voice with Apple, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. And together we can ensure that technology recognizes us all. Thanks for listening, Q. So this is the wave of the future where we're not going to just listen to Alexa. We're going to have different types of voices. It took them many years to identify this, this perfect range. Um, and it came out of, I believe, Denmark. Um, so now, as we all know, color is where we're going to go next. And this is really, I think, what many people are waiting for. Um, but it's the idea that, you know, we know that color influences all of our decisions. There have been some major shifts um, as we talk about what's going on from COVID. So we'll go through the color now. First is the potential of pink. So where pink has been um, around for a while, it got very blushy in the last few seasons, more warm, moving towards the corals. Uh, you can see that across on the top two pieces. I love that we're seeing it in outdoor. Uh, many of the, these are pictures that were, were taken from uh, trade shows around the world and showrooms that I've been going to both vir you know, virtually and, and sites I've been visiting. So we put all of this together uh, from as a global um, response, so just so you understand what we're seeing. Um, so first we see the potential of pink, where the newness is coming is across the bottom where we see it having a slightly lavender cast. We've been talking a great deal about the nuances of color and how they're infusing one into the other uh, to really, um, to make them not perfectly one or the other, the way that we find them in nature, de definitely. And also the whole idea of the way light will play with them. Daybreak, this is where the blush is going. It's moving towards a mid-tone. It's really got more, it's more saturated. It's a beautiful color. It really is like the first blush of dawn and it really looks wonderful against the warm side of the palette with the rest of the neutrals, but it plays very nicely in this new beautiful mid-range palette as well. From there, we deepen into clay court. Um, this is not as dark as the terracottas that we've been seeing in the past. It is warmer, it is redder. Um, and we definitely, as you, and, and you'll see here that I've also again included as it came down the runway often so that you can see how it really is playing across all kinds of materials and all kinds of product categories. 
We go from there, we deepen into hot seat. Hot seat is that hot lava um, color. We called it loving Lorange. We called it lava um, in our forecast. It's really about this very deepened, reddened, warmed orange. Think of all the forest fires we've been seeing all over the world that are burning millions of acres. We've been staring at these kinds of colors. They're resonating now, and this is how they're coming through, a high energy color, but not as high energy as red ahead. This is that color of passion. This is the color of protest. This is a true primary red. We haven't had it this clean and true in several seasons. In fact, last year we were talking about the pinker cast that we saw coming on, but people have moved away from that this season. And we are, are as I look now, and we really are seeing this true primary, true real red. It deepens into beetroot as we talk about the whole idea of we've been, you know, when we started forecasting it, we were talking about the wine culture. Well, so many of us have been drinking a lot more wine since we've been home with the pandemic and we see these beautiful, rich, deep burgundies coming through. We also see these plum pretty. Um, we've been talking about purple and the fact that purple is heretofore not a color that resonated very much in the United States, but it really is. And as long for me, I say here in the United States, we tend to like it with a blue cast. So as long as we look at it with a more blue cast, I think we'll be fine. It looks great in these beautiful suede surfaces or mohairs or uh, light absorbing colors as well, um, materials as well. That moves to sunflower, the bright, happy yellows, this optimistic color, you know, that when on a sunny day, it lifts our spirits. This is what we all need right now. Um, so we're gonna see a lot of optimism as we move through the palette. This is certainly one of those colors. That deepens into golden hour. It's a little lighter than the um, sort of mustard uh, yellow that was very retro that we had been forecasting, but this is definitely along those lines. It's nostalgic, it's kind of touchstone for many of us, and it's warm. And those are the things that we're really needing that really lift our spirits and again, give us hope and optimism. From there, we go to a new color that we've called olive oil. When we forecasted it, we called it haystack and it wasn't quite as green. There is a hint of green underneath this, which is what's wonderful about it and makes it look a little newer and a little fresher. And again, that's what I mean by the whole idea of nuanced color where one color just um, infusing more or less into another. Here, that slight hint of green really makes it very special and kind of new. Uh, we go from there to fern. This is not as citrusy a, a light green as we have seen. It really is sort of that level of the of the fern that we find in nature. Many of these colors you'll notice I've given nature names to because they, we really are influenced a great deal during this pandemic by nature. And interestingly enough, we had named it fern before we found that beautiful tablecloth with the fern patterning on it or those wonderful um, placemats and napkin rings. That's what that is out of the fiber there on the lower right. We then go to iciness. This is where mint is going and you can feel that breath of coolness and you look at this color. Uh, it really um, is mostly like what you see across the top and down the uh, moving down the right side, but we see both, both iterations where it looks a bit more blue on the bottom and moving across to that, that gorgeous tufted sofa. Um, um, but we also see it with the greener cast. So depending on what you're making and the material you're working in, whichever works for you, both would be fine. That goes into Peridot. Again, a color from nature, the green stone, but this beautiful, it's a lifted color from the mints of seasons past. And it moves right alongside that beautiful daybreak color. Um, it's really one part of this beautiful palette of midtones that I think are going to be very important. They're very fresh. They're very very happy. Uh, and that is also, again, something we're looking for. We move into the range of the deep, deeper into these range of greens that are the most important ranges, I believe, right now, uh, the greens and the blues. And here we're looking at dried herbs as we cook, you know, at home, we're seeing more and more of these parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, all of the different uh, cilantros and parsley, you know, uh, things that we're using to cook and to, to, uh, to um, add flavors and spices to our, to our foods. And these kinds of greens are just so fundamental, so elemental, and they really resonate with us. From there, we go to I'm Mossy. Uh, many of you know I named them to, to amuse myself from time to time, but it really is about sort of this mossy finish as well as the color. Notice how dusted many of these materials look, how, and there's a lot of volume here, and we really are talking a great deal about this comforting volume, things that envelop us as well, the rounded edges, the tufting. So all of those kinds of things, it's really about being very comfortable. Even the way it came down the runway, it's oversized, it's easy, uh, it's comfortable. 
We go from there to a new green, which we're calling fresh air. This is really a little bit different take on the teals that we've been talking about. We had forecasted something we called green tea. Uh, this has a bit more blue in it, but I really do think this is a lovely range of color. Sits gorgeously with, with almost anything. You can go to the light side of the palette. You can go to the bright side of the palette, but really just a beautiful level of a blued, a blued green. And then we go into forest bathing. This is the deeper, darker malachites and teals that we've been talking about. Again, getting off the grid, getting out into the layers of leaves. Um, you see all of these really rich, lush kinds of colors, a truly saturated uh, and, a, 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 and deep um, welcoming kind of a color, but definitely a color that makes, you know, it, it, it's soothing. It's still very soothing because this really does still call to mind nature. Then we move into the blues. The lightest of them is overcast. This is a bit different than the lighter blues we've been talking about in the past, which was a bit more like the lamps on the top, a bit truer, a bit clearer. This has gotten, you know, a little bit more green in it, a, little, a lot of gray. It's, it's really becoming more of, a, uh, you know, taking it down uh, into the tones and the hues uh, where you get these infusions happening. And um, and this is really, we, we had found uh, that we had named this color before we found that image um, where it's looking out through into an overcast day, but it really is a very calming color. I really love the carpet on the lower right with those concentric circles. That is just so lovely and lush. All the rest of these will have names that have to do with water because as I said, we are in few, in, uh, being influenced by all that's going on in the world's water. So the first is aquatic. This is the newer, the newer softer aqua. Um, it is again, part of that mid range of color. Uh, and what, what I loved about it was even the materials and the, the influences in, in the, um, the products had some sort of watery influence. Here you're seeing concrete with resin on the lower right where it almost looks like water flowing over a Bridge. And then on, on the left hand side where you see that small can be table or seating piece that is ceramic and glass. So two different companies doing a very having a very similar kind of inspiration. Then we go to a float and a float is really about the water and about not only the color of water, but the influences. So the bubbles there in glass that almost feel like sea, sea anemones or, or, or urchins or things that live below the water that would wave as the ocean waves went by. The wave of glass there in that beautiful piece uh, at the bottom. Uh, the fish scales, those are actually the scales of fish as the pattern on that, that pillow just above it. And then the way that glass artist has actually infused real shell and sand and rock and stone uh, into the glass pieces and then the watery kind of um, swirls on that tabletop. We go from there to watercolor. This is a newer blue, not as intense or true as an Eve Klein or cobalt, true cobalt blue. As you can see, there is a little bit of a nuance of that green undertone in many of these, but it flares in different ways. Um, and I just love this really clear color. Uh, it's, it's again, one of those beautiful optimistic colors. It's almost like the, the color of new, uh, newer denim. And then we move to denim friendly, which is the color of lived in, loved in jeans our favorite pair of jeans coming through in, in product. Uh, we see it in those carpets on the side, whether we're influenced by those concentric circles of water on the bottom or the, the striations and uh, of stone on the top, uh, even the concentric circles that have been rubbed in in this color on the wooden table there in the center. We go from there to deepening into ink pad. Ink pad is the new navy. It is brighter. It's it's uh, lighter. It has more color than de than the denims. Uh, the, sorry, than the indigos of the past few seasons, which were getting so dark they were almost black. This is really a true blue, and um, will be a very nice anchor to whatever you put with it. We go from there to white waters. Uh, we've been talking a great deal about how white has become seasonless. Often in this iteration, it can be a little sterile, but what we do note is when you put something in white like this, you can, you really see the form. So it's really about you warming up whatever the form is that is engaging then to the customer. Um, but it also, if you see here, a lot of volume uh, comes through in, the, in, these, um, in these pieces as well. Whereas for me, the color I really love is hopeful. This is a warmed white. It's more comforting to me. It's more cozy. It takes us over to that side where you kind of just exhale a little bit. Think of that as we say, you know, a, a can of paint with just a couple of drops of, of taupe or, or gray in it to warm it up is really quite beautiful. 
And then we deepen into shroom style, the importance of mushrooms. So not only as the food for our gourmand trend, but as we've seen as new ways to grow product with mycelia. But this taupe level of color is going to continue to be important. It's the perfect neutral. It can you know, play well with every other color in the palette, whether bright, mid-tone or, or pale. And um, certainly sit, it certainly warms up a space. Then we go to caramel. Uh, we had forecasted it as um, camel hair, actually. Um, the idea of men's camel hair coats from the 40s and 50s where things were thought of as solid and, and people were you know, going to work and things were okay. Uh, this is one of those kind of touchstone colors, but it really has got a lot more life and a lot more, um, it, it's a little more succulent. It, it has a little more, you know, it's tasty um, when, you, when you look at it in terms of the way it can anchor a room and then you can play with it, uh, with the things around it. And then pipeline for the type of, of metallic we see, it's not quite copper, it's not quite brass. It really kind of, again, has that nuance and resonates between one and the other. That's a carpet there in the center with that fabulous deco look. Um, but I love that sconce that looks like a pipe, uh, but scored there as well. So that sense of, not, of, of um, again, one of those, those uh, metallics that has some personality. We then go to wet earth. This is the lighter of the browns that we're seeing. A uh, little red in the cast, which is why we called it wet earth and not just earth. It really does feel kind of like wet soil. Um, and we love it in all of these different materials and all of these different iterations. Some of them right from the New York show, like the little stool, uh, scalloped felt stool on the bottom. Um, we also go from there to the deepness of solid ground. This is the earthiest of them. Uh, that textile at the bottom on the right, also something from New York Now. I realize I haven't been calling them all out, but there's lots of images here that we got from the digital show that you can go back through and find. Um, but we really do love this. We, we, we forecasted it as espresso, uh, talking about the coffee culture and how many of us spend so much time staring to, into that warm, warm dark chocolate li uh, liquid. Um, but we really have become accustomed to this as the new solid, foundation for neutrals. Grays will continue and we had called a few of them out in our forecast and we're seeing fog emerging, this beautiful uh, misty sort of color firmly ensconced on the light side and the cooler side of the palette and then cement on the darker side of the palette, more heavy, more solid, offering us that firm foundation. And then blackout, where we see the matte blacks continuing in importance. Certainly several things here coming from the New York Now show, the, the wonderful folded bottom uh, blackout, the bowl next to blackout on the bottom, and then the rubber um, knit, knitted over chunk, oversized chunky knit piece also coming from, can be found on the digital market. And then lastly into the palettes, we see the pale palettes. Uh, so we've been talking a great deal about that mid range, but here's where we see the pales. They're newer and they're more interesting and they're more nuanced to think about if we usually, when we were talking about from the, you know, the beginnings of the pale palette, they were baby blues and pinks and baby yellows. Well, look at these colors. They're much more sophisticated. They're much more complex. Um, and they really do speak to um, something that gives us, you know, I, I love that stack of, of hand um, uh, woven throws on the on the upper left or the the terrazzo kind of flex on the ceramics on the right and again um, that wonderful chair on the bottom you've seen it in one of the other ones in the neutral combination but here the way they played all of these mixed materials together another big trend um, to give you again a sense of volume but also a play of mixed material we go from there to modern moments. This is the palette that in, that uses all of those beautiful midtones that we've been calling out throughout the, the presentation. So you can see here how we see them work together. Love it in the carpet up on the top or that stack of beautiful pillows edged in gray. I just love the way that they edged that in that little gray stripe, really gave a lot of personality to those pillows. Nature's Bounty, we continue the conversation about nat natural dyes, the importance of natural dyes um, and, uh, and how we, 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 are, we, we are seeing people who are working by hand, the artisans working by hand are going back years to look at some of the brightness that they're able to achieve in natural dyes because we had really sort of narrowed into a very particular palette. And now we see these earthy colors coming from all kinds of vegetables and plants and flowers, et cetera, um, wood, all kinds of things that they're using, berries and, 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 and cochineal beetles and things like that to dye these wonderful colors. Bauhaus is probably one of my favorites. It's a new lifted pattern grounded in that wet earth brown, really about the geometrics and the way these forms play together, very strong, very bold, uh, very unapologetic. 
Then we go to be optimistic. This is where we see uh, the first part of the, you know, sort of the brighter part of the palette. Um, these are like the tertiary colors, but I love again, those factions and fractions, the way colors broken up and used together here. And then the pandemic palette is really the true saturated brights that are more of the secondary uh, palettes of color um, mixed with the primaries. And so you get these really kind of frenetic uh, colors, but how it really enlivens those, those the picture and glasses up on the top right where those are very um, classic forms, but in those new bright colors. We go then to reflection pool, the use of these blues and greens that we've been talking out together. Um, this whole idea of watery reflections, bubbles, things like that, that really are calming. When you put these colors together, they really do look really beautiful and they, they sort of bring our blood pressure down. And then net neutrality, the use of cool and warm uh, neutrals together, a lot of light wood continuing to be important and rising in importance. So the, 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 you know, that unbleached kind of look to the wood going to be continuing, but the idea of grays and beiges working together. And mystery theater, we're talking about sort of the cool side of the dark palette, the teals, the purple, the dark purples, the dark emerald greens, things like that here. And then on the warm side of the palette, we see shadow boxing where we're seeing more of the, the but what's, up, what's happening here is it's crossed with black or accented with black. So it really is the darker version of those colors. And then black and white all over, the way that we're seeing pattern being used when you really get upset and you don't know where to turn, black and white is always good. Um, it always creates a wonderful dynamic look and we continue to see that as important, <clears throat> whether it's in that the rug on the top right that is more like the Bauhaus kind of cut uh, bold graphic pieces, the, checker, the checkered board, the larger scale gingham on the bottom, with the, with the inlaid pieces or even the hand woven uh, fiber on the bottom left. So I urge you to live life colorfully. I know I've gone over a little, but I really wanted to get as deep into everything as I could. So we, if you wanna come back, I'll stop sharing. Here's how you can connect with me. Please reach out, please follow me on Instagram, You know, contact me on my website if you'd like me to do uh, anything with you or your company, but I am really thrilled to be here. And I hope that that gave you so much information that you're gonna run out and be just over the top with what you're going to design next. Well, there is no doubt you have given us such extremely thorough information and always inspirational as always, Patty. <laughs> the depth is so appreciated. Um, your trust acronym resonates with us on so many levels. Yeah. Um, just as a reminder, today's session was being recorded and will be available for immediate access on demand following our presentation. And I think we are good with questions and we've got your contact information. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for joining us today for translating ma macro trends, connecting the dots mm -hmm. with, as always, the enchanted, enchanting Patty Carpenter. Thank you so much. You are such a dear yeah. friend of ours and we so appreciate you. Oh, thank you. And I just saw in the chat, I didn't have the chat up because I was going through, so I couldn't see it, but Kings Road, that's where the, the humble, <laughs> I see that now. Thank you for whoever remembered and called that out. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Take good care. Stay safe. Stay well. Bye-bye. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs> Bye.